And so, but of course, if you disobeyed the headmaster, you'd go to the police station, and no one wanted to go to the police station, and then you might go to the second, and you might go to the toilet, toilet, okay, awful. So stay a child. You'll have some bread subsidies. We'll give you a fake government, fake ministries, fake newspapers, fake elections, of course. And when these three things came together, experience of traveling abroad, seeing other countries, improved education, and of course the technology, I think, and this applies, that the Egyptians grew up, only to discover that their government was full of children, one of whom was 83 years old. <laughs> and that was the end. So what I'm trying to say, I suppose, is that um, you know, the whole seamless, not seamless, but the whole trail of revolution, insurgency, call it what you like, is, uh, begins much earlier than the famous January 25th date. And without wanting to be humorous about it, it took a sort of strange course as all sort of things coalesced together, trade unions, students, um, Islamists, there were some around, although I have to say that I remember one of the most disturbing moments after uh, Mubarak went was to turn on my television and see Tantawi talking to these rather plump bearded gentlemen from the Brotherhood. And I remember looking and saying, I didn't see them in Tahrir Square, did I? And that, of course, is where we're going on from now. That's the next part of the story, of course, and so on and so forth. And I don't know the degree to which the elections will actually be used, as I say, to, to disinherit Tahrir, to destroy the integrity of Tahrir and what it represented. Um, and I don't know, of course, what the further election results are going to be, though I suspect I do know, based on what I gather about eight minutes ago, the government started to say, um, which is a very unexpectedly successful result in, in its own terms for the Salafists, which is worth uh, reflecting upon. Obviously, tomorrow's demonstration, whatever it is in Tahrir Square, um, pray it not be violent, but I think it's going to be, um, uh, I, the numbers are going to have to be, are going to be the most seriously counted figures in Tahrir ever. Um, it, it depends how many people turn up. Um, I suppose I ought to also briefly talk about Syria, since I've just been there. And I'll tell you, for your amusement, I couldn't get a visa any more than anyone else could. And I couldn't even get through to Buthayna Shah, um, uh, Bashar Assad's personal advisor, whom I've known for many years, friend and so on. And I was sitting having dinner in Beirut um, with Walid Drumblat and saying, I can't even get hold of Shaban, you know? And Mrs. Shaban, and he said, oh, Robert, I just read in Al Hayat that she's going to Moscow on Saturday to see the Deputy Soviet Foreign Minister. Russian foreign minister, Freudian slip. Um, so I, next it was Thursday night, I rushed round to a friend of mine in Tass in Beirut on the Friday morning, who rushed me round to the Russian embassy and got me a visa in 35 minutes, which I think is a record. I rushed to Beirut airport, jumped on an Aeroflot flight to Moscow, and when, uh, Sha when, when Buthayna Shaban's uh, limousine, complete with Syrian flag and gold fringes on the side, turned up at the Russian foreign ministry in Moscow. There I was on the steps saying, Bothaina, I came just to see you. <laughs> and all the Russians were waiting in the background, looking at their watches, and she chatted away for six minutes, agreed to see me in the evening, and I got my visa. <laughs> now in the Syrian foreign ministry, it is said that I'm the only person they know who had to go from Beirut to Damascus via Moscow. It is, after all, less than two hours' drive from my front door to Damascus. But I got there. I could only move around in Damascus, but I was free to move. I had no minders, no watchers. I could talk to people in the opposition, which I did with great care. Um, I went to the funeral of two Syrian soldiers who'd been killed the previous day in Daraa by a sniper. And one of the things you learn very quickly, yes, I have no doubts the 3,500 UN figure of unarmed civilians is all true. I have no doubt about that. But there is now a very serious military insurgency against the Syrian government. That part is also true. Very interesting, I met the families of the dead soldiers. I went to the funeral, they had the Chopin funeral march complete with people ululating and so on. And I met the commanding officer by name. I had his name, they were handing out telephone numbers. The Syrian army is the only thing that stands now between the regime and the insurgency, or the opposition. And the major I was talking to, I suddenly said, why aren't you in uniform? You know, his own soldiers have been buried. He said, I had to drive from Dara this morning myself. In other words, you can't drive in military uniform on the main highways of Syria without being shot. Um, many of my friends in Damascus tell me that when they go to Aleppo, they would not dare use the international highway. They fly. When you've got a country 
like Afghanistan, where to go from Kabul to Kandahar, you've got to fly, you can't use the highway, you have a problem. And the problem is clearly growing. I, I spoke to a Christian friend of mine in Damascus whose cousin, a retired chemical engineer, um, in Homs, which is now a sectarian war in Homs. People are having their heads chopped off there. Um, he described how his cousin had answered the phone, uh, not the phone, the door one night, not, 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 um, uh, Syri two Syrian soldiers, please can we have some water? So he gave them two bottles of water. And in the morning, knock, knock, knock again, and two armed men who shot him dead in the chest because he gave water to the soldiers. And of course, we know the degree to which the Christian community in Syria has, is in effect being co-opted <coughs> through fear and through stories and through genuine fear into supporting along with the Sunni elites and the Alawis, of course, and so on. Um, the powers that be, who still are telling us there are going to be reforms, new constitutions, so on and so forth. Um, you know, if I turn on, I, I watch Syrian TV at home in Beirut, and uh, it's amazing, every Sunday morning, all these cardinals, bishops, patriarchs, all saying, you know, stay with the government, they're going to protect us, it's all right. Patriarch, um, uh, um, Patriarch uh, Rai, Bashar Rai, as you may know, in Lebanon, actually said to Sarkozy, you know, give Bashar uh, more time. And for that, he lost an interview with Obama. Not a terrible sacrifice, I'd have to say, but there we go. Um, but, you know, one shouldn't doubt the fears, the genuine fears of Christians, both in Lebanon now, of course, and in Syria. If you go to northern Lebanon in Tripoli, not the other Tripoli, but the Lebanese Tripoli, uh, where there are substantial Alawi population on Jebel Mossam, above the city, with the Sunni population below, the only thing that separates them is the Crusader castle, the Chateau de saint gilles <laughs> So I wandered in there, and there was the Lebanese army with machine gun nests at both sides of the castle to keep both sides apart. So one question, of course, the Lebanese are asking, me too, is in desperation, would the government in Damascus throw a match into Lebanon? A lighted match, of course. Um, I must say, having been in Damascus for almost a week, and moving around completely freely and talking to people I know and trust for many years, I don't get the impression Bashar al-Assad is about to go. Um, you know, you, you read the Wall Street Journal and it tells you only days left. But if the Wall Street Journal tells you that, you know he's there for much longer. But the, the point is that I, I, you don't get the feeling in Damascus that this state is about to collapse. But if it does, it will be a civil war, of course, as it already is in Homs. Um, uh, the Deputy Foreign Minister said, I can't get you to Homs because you might be killed and then the British government will blame us. To which I said, they probably will. They won't cry that much. And anyway, since when did you care what the Brits say? Um, I've now been promised I will be allowed to go to Homs. As I always say in Syria, we shall see. Um, one, perhaps a final point, which is for me the greatest uh, comical moment, was when just before I was due to leave, Syrian television approached me and said, oh, Mr. Robert, can we have an interview with you? And normally I, I say no, and I thought, well, let's just see what we do. I said, look. I'll do an interview with you, and they did, by the way, in the lobby of the, um, the Sheraton Hotel with three cameras, you know, big job. Half an hour interview, and I said, to them, yeah, you do an interview, and I'm going to print in the Independent everything you censor out of our interview. And I said, you know, Bashar al-Assad is running out of time, fast, you cannot infantilize the Arab people, etc., etc. I said, why don't you let Western journalists go to Hobbes? Of course they should go. Anyway. I'm just back on Saturday night in Beirut, sit down, turn on Syrian television. I'm not actually addicted to Syrian TV. It's not unlike Egyptian television was. You know. but amazing, Mubarak surrounded Egyptian TV with tanks. Can you imagine that? Nobody was watching Egyptian TV. You could do this in 61. do in 2000. It was absolutely preposterous. That's the Donald Duck bit. Anyway, I turned on the Syrian television, and there was my interview, and they didn't cut a line. Why not? I have no idea. Unless... They wanted, and it was my voice with subtitles, and the subtitles were pretty good. And I, I had a Lebanese um, academic sitting next to me watching every subtitle to make sure they looked perfect. Um, and I think one of the things the Syrians are trying to do, it may be part of a fear thing, let a reporter say how bad things are in Syria, because then the people may support the president even more. I don't know. But certainly, um, I, a lot of Syrians I met had watched. Syrian television showed the Gaddafi video of him covered in blood and then the shooting. And I asked Mokhtar, the deputy, Faisal Mokhtar, the deputy foreign minister, said, what did you think when you saw that? They did show it. And, and I know that Assad saw it, though I don't know his uh, reaction. Uh, but you know, the, the version in the West is, oh, they must have been filled with terror, right? 
And Moncler said, I think that everyone I spoke to, he said, is worried that the West will use these pictures to show how barbaric Muslims and Arabs are. And indeed, they've already started to do that. I've read this in American papers. So they got that bit right. Um, I don't think it's acting as a sort of, quote, terror, unquote, uh, to the regime. And one reason why it may not be is I suspect the Americans still want, in some form, to keep Bashar al-Assad from Syria. There was a very interesting press conference about four weeks ago now, which uh, La Clinton, as I call her, gave at the State Department. This is Clinton. And uh, she said, it's time for Bashar al-Assad to step aside. You're familiar with the pattern here, Putnam. And then one of the sort of fawning reporters of State Department correspondents said, uh, Mrs. Clinton, Mrs. Clinton, you know how soon would Bashar al-Assad go? Well, he's got to step down. And then she stopped, no, I mean step aside. She corrected herself. Now stepping down, that's one thing. That means you're finished. But stepping aside means there may be yet a role. And I suspect that Israel has told Obama, it might be a good idea if we could somehow keep Bashar in some form. Better the enemy you know than the enemy you don't know. In the same way, of course, in the last days of Mubarak, we had um, King Abdullah of Saudi Arabia and Mr. Netanyahu on the same telephone line pleading with Obama to keep Mubarak. So I think the same sort of thing might be happening in Syria to some extent. And the Syrians are very, very bright people. Um, uh, you know, I think the, the, the Syrian regime has realized this. Um, I don't think that the sanctions of the Arab League, which I now refer to, by the way, as the Qatar League, which is what it is, um, I don't think they're actually going to bring down the regime. Um, I was in Istanbul, and there was very interesting, because I talked to the Syrian National Council people, particularly Khaled Hoja, who's a long-standing member of the opposition. Uh, his father was in prison in Damascus for 14 years, his mother for 15 years. Uh, for five years, he for one year, three uncles shot dead, assassinated by the regime. And he not only wants a Turkish cordon sanitaire in northern Syria, but he wants King Abdul of Jordan to put a cordon sanitaire in the south of Syria. In other words, do a UN sanctions on Saddam on Syria, which is an interesting idea because I suspect that that would be the moment, you see, when the armed insurgency could then put their feet on Syrian soil and say, we have territory. Which, of course, is what the Libyan insurgents could do in Tobruk and Benghazi until NATO rushed in to rescue them because Libya wanted so much liberation. Forget about oil, I don't talk about oil at all, ever, ever, ever. Um, you know, I still have people telling reporters like me and others, Iraq was not about oil. Even now. I mean, if, if Iraq, if Iraq's national major export product had been asparagus, do you think the 82nd Airborne would have gone to Baghdad and Mosul? Not of course they wouldn't, would they? And that, you know, when, when, when I hear Erdogan, um, I learned in Turkey for the first time, some time ago, it's not Erdogan, it's Erdogan, because it's a soft G with two dots. When Erdogan said, I think the West does not interest itself in Syria because it doesn't have so much oil, he may well be right. 